Okay, so the last two videos we talked about gear, we talked about rod and rail combos, we talked about the tackle you need, we talked about how to make leaders. So at this point you have the basics to get out there and start fishing. So next most logical thing is what do you use for bait and how do you find that bait? Now fishing up around Boston Harbor and up along the North Shore which is where I'm fishing, primary bait source up here is mackerel. Now, we also, in the summertime, will see schools of pogies, other parts of the country known as bunker. We get herring up here. Even in a pinch situation, if you can find some juvenile-sized pollock, about so big, those will work pretty good too. Occasionally, we even see squid up here, but primarily mackerel is what we're gonna be using. Now, one thing that I gotta stress to you with mackerel fishing is this. People make this sound like it's the easiest thing in the world, okay? You talk to people and they tell you, oh yeah, we got a dozen mackerel right off the bat. We had plenty of bait, we were good, yeah, okay. That does not happen all the time. Believe me when I tell you that. Beginning of the season, there's a lot of mackerel around. The reason being the water is a little bit cooler. So from about the middle of May to maybe the first week of June, we see that water temperature in basically the upper 50s and the lower 60s. You see a lot of mackerel around here. There's a lot of pretty big schools. And you can pretty much go out and catch mackerel any time of day and it's not that hot. But right around the first week of June, that water starts to warm up. So you go from basically high 50s, low 60s, more consistently into the mid 60s. When that happens, those schools start to thin out because the bigger mackerel will start going a few miles offshore into the colder water. A couple of other things start happening too. More fish start showing up and they start feeding on those mackerel that are inshore and just off the beach. And at the same time as the weather's getting nicer, a lot more people are coming out in their boats and they're starting to fish for mackerel too. So long story short, you have three things happening which basically cause those schools of mackerel to thin out. By the time you hit the beginning of July, it gets real tricky. The very beginning of July, if you get out there early in the morning, you can probably still find mackerel, okay? Back up a little bit towards middle of May, beginning of June, any time of day you can find them. You start getting to the end of June, beginning of July, you gotta get out there real early in the morning. By the time you hit midsummer, when that water's really warm, it gets tough to find mackerel. So the thing is this, if you're having to put a couple of hours into finding mackerel, and occasionally you have a day where you just can't find bait, don't feel bad. It happens. You're not alone. So we're going to talk about what you have to do to find mackerel, but the biggest thing is know that it's not easy, and there are plenty of days where you have to put a good couple of hours in grinds to find those bait fish. All right, around here, sabiki rigs are what we use to fish for mackerel most of the time. Now, there are rods that you can buy that are actually sabiki rods. And for those of you who don't know what sabiki rigs are, I'm going to talk about that in a second, okay? But I want to show you the setup that I use right here, okay? Sabiki rods is the reason I don't use them, and I'm going to tell you about that in a second. There's nothing, I think they're great pieces of equipment. A lot of people love them, and they swear by them. I fish with them, and they are great. But this is the setup that I like to use. This is just a basic, it's actually a freshwater setup. You can usually buy these at pretty much like any sporting goods store. You probably pick them up for like 30, 40 bucks something like that they're very lightweight you can see that tip there it's a very flimsy as I said a second ago geared more for a freshwater environment type of rod but when you pull up a full string of mackerel with something like this it's a lot of fun that's kind of why I don't use the sabiki rod the sabiki rod is more of a utility piece of equipment it's geared more for commercial fishing than anything else it doesn't mean you can't use it in a non-commercial fishery right but thing is when you catch mackerel with this it's a lot of fun and also I do a lot of trolling for mackerel too so when you set these rods in the holder and you see that rod start dipping down like this you know you're getting the bites at that point if you're using a sabiki rod it's a little bit more heavy duty you don't really see when you have the bite when you're trolling you have to constantly be jigging and you have to know you have to pay attention to when you're getting the bite with it but the one thing that I gotta stress to you too is whatever you use whether it's a sabiki rod or something lighter weight like this have dedicated bait gear on your boat. The rods that I showed you in the last couple of videos, those aren't rods that you want to use on a regular basis to fish with bait. When you fish with bait, you're gonna get mackerel scales and slime all over these things. The good rods that you want to use, save those specifically for what you're fishing for and have dedicated bait gear on the boat. All right, so sabiki rigs is what we use to catch mackerel up here. And there's a bunch of different types of sabiki rigs out there. More, more to the point, there's a bunch of different brands of sabiki rigs. One that I like is Hayabusa. They're kind of like, in my opinion, the Rolls Royce of sabiki rigs. Now, the thing about them is they're a little expensive. Usually you're talking about six or seven bucks a string. The thing that I like about Hayabusa is usually you can get bigger hooks on them and they have a bunch of different varieties where they have multiple color variations, which I think is important, right? And as crazy as this sounds, even fishing with bait fish, there's some days that I'll notice the mackerel are only biting on one color of feathers. Like you see, you've got basically green, you've got red. There's some days out there that you'll see that they're only biting on the red or they're only biting on the green. So if you can put a different color spread down there, you're increasing your chances on the days when it's really hard to get mackerel to get yourself into the bait because as crazy as it sounds, sometimes they will only bite on certain colors out there. So Hayabusa, like I said, they have a lot of good color variations, a lot of good patterns. And the other thing too is that they have bigger hooks. This is a size 14 hook. 
minimum is a size 14 up to a maximum size 16. And when I say minimum and maximum, I'm talking about my personal preference. There's a lot of these other Sabiki rigs out there that are kind of like more generic brands where the hooks in them are very tiny. They don't have a lot of color variations. They're usually just one straight color all through the string. Those aren't necessarily the ones that you want to use. There's nothing wrong with using them. They work, they will catch mackerel, but in my opinion, you're better off spending six or seven bucks. It's a little more, it's a little more expensive, needless to say, compared to the alternative, but you're gonna get better quality out of it, and I do think that they produce better than the generic brand out there. Now, when you buy them, you typically get six on a string. What I always do is I cut two of them off, and I only fish four to a string. Those last two, these things are going to tangle all the time. And by the way, if you've never used them before, be careful. You're going to hook yourself with these things. They're going to, they're going to hook things on your boat. Um, they're going to tangle a lot. So when you cut those last two off, you're decreasing the chances of those things tangling. Because the other thing too is, as you start catching mackerel, when you start jigging mackerel and you hook into a full string of them, you get six mackerel swimming around in all different directions. The more you have on there, the more likely it is that that rig is gonna foul and it's gonna tangle up. So if you cut those last two off and you fish with four, you're doing yourself a favor. And the beauty in that too, is that you can take the two that you cut off of each string and basically take two packages and turn them into three different setups or three strings of four. And what I always do is when I cut them up, I just put the strings of four in a Ziploc bags like this. Never wanna throw these things into the same bag. One rig, one Ziploc bag, and then what I do, is just put them into one big sabiki bag that I have all my sabikis ready to go. So this way here, you're not basically doing it on the boat. That's the last thing that you want to be doing when you're out there in a rough day, you're bouncing around a little bit, is trying to sort sabiki rigs out. Have them all in their bags, have them ready to go. And in fact, what you really want to do is have them on your dedicated bait rods already at the ready so that when you get out there, you're ready to drop those lines in the water and start catching mackerel right away. So I throw a two and three ounce weight on my sabiki rigs. Let me show you something here. All right, in this particular case, I got a three ounce weight. And what I did was I just tied some monofilament to it in a loop and just clipped it onto the end of the sabiki rig right here. Reason that I do this, okay, there's some people that'll tell you, take like a cast master or a weighted jig head and put it on the ends and you can get yourself one more mackerel. And that's absolutely true. There's nothing wrong with doing that until you have to go de-hook them. All right, when you're out on the boat and you go to de-hook a full string of these, a full string of these mackerel that are on the sabiki rigs right here, there's kind of two ways to do this. You can basically take the ring, shake it up and down like this here, and try to get a bunch of them to drop off. Sometimes that happens. If you have a hook on the end of this, a weighted hook, whether it's a cast master or a weighted jig head, go and try to grab onto that as the boat's rocking. That hook's gonna end up sticking right in your hand. What you wanna do is just take that weight, hold it in your hand like this, and then you come by with the sabiki de hooker. I'm gonna show you this in a couple minutes when we go out there and we start catching them. And you just come by and plop them off all the way down the line drop them into a bucket and the bucket goes right into the live well. Get these rigs, okay, the hooks on them, and again, buy the hooks that are size 14 to size 16, okay? The bigger the hook, the better, because if you get those smaller hooks, it's very hard to de-hook these fish. One of the things you can do to help you out when you're trying to de-hook the mackerel, which can be pretty tough out there, especially in a rough day when the boat's rocking around, it's not that easy, mash the barbs down on this. So take a pair of pliers and just crush the barb right there on the back side of that hook. And if you crush the barbs down, you can shake them off pretty easily, or you can get the sabiki de hooker and get them off just as easy that way too. So Steve, tell us a little bit about this uh, this yo-yo setup you got here. All right, so we got a, uh, a double sabiki here. So it's two rigs attached together with a six ounce diamond. Keep it down at the bottom. And uh, you know, everybody knows sabikis are, eh, they get tangled, but you put them on the yo-yo, just wrap them around and then just slowly, take them off and it'll get there, it takes a couple minutes, but it'll get there. It's better than throwing it all together in the pool. Now you run the full six six hooks on a rig. Usually what I do is I cut mine off and I only fish four, but the benefit here is you double and sometimes on the other one like you have over there, you triple that one up. So you're covering a lot more a lot more column of the water. You're basically between the two of them almost covering the entire water column. You yep. risk the tangles, but you get the bait a little bit faster. Right, so if you, if you hit a school of max, you could end up, you know, 10 dozen max or so, which is great, so you get all your bait. The other thing too, where you're covering so much of that water column right there, you can see if you're only getting them on the top third or on the middle third, whatever the case is, you get a pretty good idea of exactly where they are in the water column. So it's a little bit easier to dial them in. Yeah, so you just follow the fish finder. We can sometimes, we can see the little schools of max, and then we can get it down to right around that level. Yeah. 
think it's in the very bottom. So this is the downside. Right, so you just gotta just be able, you know what I mean? Just follow it down like that little rope. Yep, it's a man. Woo, a big man. So, well, a lot of work for one man, but we got it. So we figured out right there that if that thing's if that thing's catching wet right on the ends, he's down there. He's down, dead there down, down deeper deep. today. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when they're jigging for mackerel is this. Okay, when you're on that drift like I'm talking about, you've got one of them sitting down at 10 feet, the other one sitting at 20 feet, and that's not always where the mackerel are going to be, by the way. But that's where I start off. Mackerel tend to stay towards the top of the water column. So if you have one of your rigs at 10, another one at 20, chances are you'll, you'll dial in the mackerel. Sometimes you have to go a little bit deeper. Sometimes you have to go a little bit shallower. I was out fishing a couple of days ago, and the mackerel were almost right in the surface. So if you're not getting them at 10 or 20, don't be afraid to adjust the depth of them and see if you can find them over there. Okay, but. Regardless, when you're jigging for mackerel, one of the things I see a lot of people do is this. They make these really aggressive, really big jig movements. Like I said, a lot of times mackerel are feeding on that organic matter that's growing on a lot of those anchor chains for those navigational buoys, or sometimes the growth that just piles up on some lobster, on some lobster pot buoys. And if they're not feeding on that, they're usually feeding on basically small minnows, shad, sand dales, or something like that. So you want to mimic the presentation of what it is that they're feeding on, right? So these feathers basically are trying to simulate what theoretically what a mackerel would theoretically see as like a sand dale or something like that. Now sand dales aren't gonna make these giant streaks up in the water like this. They make these kind of smaller, just up and down movements like this here. So don't jig super aggressively like this. Just kind of small calculated movements like that. And I think you're gonna find that you're gonna get a lot more mackerel that way. Now, when you do start getting a bite and you're jigging, the mistake that a lot of people make is they just leave the rig there. All right, like I said, this rig, it's got four hooks on it, okay? If you leave it there, the mackerel are gonna swim all over the place. That's how this is gonna follow. So what I do, if I'm starting to feel some bites, I lower it down just a little bit because usually the mackerel will bite as you're lowering this down. So if there's a couple more there, lower it down and usually you'll find you'll pick a couple more up. But I don't know. So let's talk about actually how you go and do this. You gotta find the spots where the mackerel are at. And typically, mackerel are gonna hang out in the same couple of areas on a pretty regular basis. They're not always gonna be there, but the areas that you know produce mackerel are the spots that you wanna to go to. So you gotta do the homework, talk to some of the locals, ask some people ask some people to dial you in, some spots that, that typically produce mackerel, and go out there and try to find them. Now what I do, my strategy, is when I go to a particular spot, for example, a lot of channel markers, a lot of navigational buoys out there, mackerel tend to hang around them. My thought process on why they tend to hang around those navigational buoys in open water is because that anchor chain on that buoy develops a lot of seaweed and a lot of growth. And I think the mackerel are going in there and they're feeding off of that, right? A lot of what they're feeding on is organic matter. Sometimes they're feeding on small sand dales and things like that. But basically when you get those buoys like that out in navigational water, and whether it's a navigational buoy or even a buoy in a lobster pot, okay, tend to see mackerel in a lot of those areas. So again, when you find those areas that you know that the mackerel are at, what I do, in this particular case, if it's a navigational buoy or something like that, is I go to that area, I put my lines out, and I start trolling around that area to try to dial in exactly where the mackerel are at. Typically what you're gonna find is that the mackerel will basically stay on one side or one little area of that buoy, right? So what I do is I cast the rods out behind the boat, and I just start trolling it anywhere between about two to three knots, and I basically make a big circle all the way around that buoy. Now, sometimes you're not gonna hit them, but if you do, what you'll probably notice is that if you make that big circle, say that you circle around it twice, okay? You're gonna notice more often than not that you're gonna hit the mackerel in that same spot. So say that you get right on the south side of that channel marker or whatever it is that you're fishing, you're gonna notice, okay, I circled around it once, I caught two of them there. When I came back around again on the south, on the south side of it, I got another two. Now you've dialed in where they are. Once you find them at that particular point, set up and start drifting through that particular area. Because as you troll through it, you're on them one second, then you're off them the next. But when you drift through, you'll stay right over the top of that school. Now, you wanna use basically different weights. What I do is I have a three ounce weight, then I have a two ounce weight. The reason being is that I wanna fish at different depths. The three ounce weight I know drops 10 feet in a second and a half, the two ounce weight drops 10 feet in two seconds. So what I try to do is set it up so that I've got one at 10 feet and I've got one at 20 feet. And as I make my drift, 
if they're up higher or they're down lower in the water column, I know I can find them, okay? If I don't see any signs of life, I'm usually out of there. And that's the other thing too, is if you don't see the mackerel there after about 10 or 15 minutes, the mackerel might not be there. So go to the next spot, right? And when I say signs of life, there's a couple of ways that you can gauge signs of life, okay? Number one, are you catching mackerel? Number two, are any other boats in the area catching mackerel, okay? Number three, are there any birds hanging out there? Birds are a good indicator that there's fish around. Okay, the last thing, do you see any slicks on the surface to indicate there might have been, and when I say slicks, basically oil slicks. Think of it like this, fish are very oily, right? So if a school of mackerel are around, some stripers or bluefish come by and they start feeding on those fish, what ends up happening? They feed in them and all that fish oil from whatever they're feeding on, whether it's mackerel, herring, bunker, pogies, whatever, okay? that oil is going to float up to the surface and it's going to sit in a very kind of confined area. If you see that slick on the surface, okay, chances are there was a feed taking place, which obviously that's an indicator that there was some sort of bait in the area. But it depends. Also, don't forget about the fish finder, the most obvious one. Are you marking mackerel in the area? Are you marking fish? If you're not... seeing any signs of life and you've made two passes around that buoy or whatever feature it is that you're fishing around onto the next spot don't sit there and grind on it the mackerel just aren't there so like i said make a pass or two dial them in drift through it jig them up and you should find mackerel provided that they're there and keep in mind it's not always going to happen that easy there's plenty of times you go out there and it takes you hours to get bait sometimes you're going to go out and you just can't find bait it does happen now alternatives in the situations that you can't find bait Around this area, if you can find a ledge that has a shallow high ground, okay, there's a couple of spots out here where basically you have deep water, you have a big ledge, and at the top of that ledge, that high ground is right around 20 feet of water. A lot of times in this area, right around the month of June up towards about the beginning of July, when the water temperature is in about the mid-60s, juvenile-sized pollock about this big will tend to sit right on the top of those high grounds. So if you can find those high grounds at about 20 feet on the days that you can't find mackerel, Take those sabiki rigs, drop them straight down to the bottom, rail them up about a crank or two, and you should be able to load up with a ton of juvenile sized pollock, which if you live line those, are a great alternative to live mackerel. The other thing too is the water heats up as the season get, as the season progresses. Schools of pogies, and as I said a little while ago, other parts of the country known as bunker come into the area. Now, those aren't gonna feed in sabiki rigs. What I use for that is just a snag hook. Okay, now again, dedicated bait rods. You're gonna need something a little bit more heavy duty, and I just, I, this is a Shakespeare Alpha. I picked this up, I think, for 35 bucks a few years ago. I've got two of them on the boat. They always have weighted treble hooks on it because the thing about pogies is that it's basically a sight fishing type of tactic. What you have to do is you have to see the bunker break, or the pogies or the bunker breaking on the surface. Sometimes you'll hear them first, you'll hear some flopping. You look over and you'll see a little bit of splashing. Okay, that's a school of bunker. What you do is you position yourself in such a way that you can just cast right onto them with a weighted snag hook like this, just a weighted treble hook, three ounces. And the key to it, you don't start railing in right away. You cast out, you let that drop down just a little bit. Give it about two to three seconds, let it drop down, click it off, and then start railing it in aggressively. The second you feel a thump on there, rip back, set the hook into it, you should be able to snag yourself a couple of bunker. The thing about snagging pogies or bunker is it's tricky. You have to be in just the right place at just the right time to find that school of fish, so it's not that easy to do. It's probably, my opinion up here, it's the most difficult way to get bait, and if I have my choice, I'd rather go out and try to find the mackerel. If I'm cruising around and I'm trying to find mackerel, and it just so happens that I come across, across a school of bunker and I'm not catching mackerel, have these rods at the ready, that's bailed me out more than once, okay? But primarily, I'm going after the mackerel. So anyway, we talked about what you have to do. Let's go out there and go do it. I'm gonna show you what it looks like if you do it the right way.